Hi, and welcome along to AFTV News Daily. I'm glad to have you guys here tonight. Remember, we are broadcasting across the platforms of YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and also via Periscope onto Twitter. We're live on all of those platforms tonight. So very, very nice to have you here. And very, very nice to have our special guest, which is Arsenal legend, brilliant striker in his day. I also love watching him play. Mr. Kevin Campbell also played for Everton as well. We are going to mention him. <laughs> <laughs> but that, 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 that important, right? Arsenal is the one that was important to us. And uh, it's great to have you, Kev. Uh, Robbie, thanks for having me on. Um, really appreciate the, the, the opportunity to come on. I, you, obviously, I usually watch you guys doing the, this daily thing anyway. So it's my time now. It's your time now. What have you been up to, man? I mean, the lockdown's been in full effect now for just over a week. How's it been for you? Because I know that you're another guy that you're a bit like me, 100 miles an hour everywhere, going over to Spain and doing stuff, going here, there, everywhere. I mean, what, what's it been like for you? Um, the, the truth of the matter is, Robbie, it's been a bit uh, of a retreat. Um, very rarely I actually get an opportunity to, to take the wind out myself and uh, have, time, have time for myself have time to reflect and time to kind of plan because usually, you know, I'm here, there and everywhere, like you said, just like yourself. So, you know, this lockdown thing is I've had to respect it, obviously, because of what's going on. Um, but I've got a routine. I've got a plan. I could do a, a lot more stuff, um, podcasts, etc. I could contact a lot of people who I need to contact as well, who probably wouldn't hear from me. So I'm just trying to, to make the most of the time, doing a lot of reading up and stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's, I, I'm enjoying it, actually. It's weird. I am enjoying the time. Mm. It's a bit of a reset, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. What, what about your... Uh, obviously, I know your son. Um, he's a footballer, professional footballer, plays for Stoke Was as well. was starting to have a really good season as well, weren't yeah. he? And, and, and everything. And... That's been brought to an abrupt halt. What what's it been like for him? Well, for Ty uh, and me, me youngest boy Kyle, who was at Buxton, um, obviously the lockdown has left them th um, kind of in a not in a limbo, but they're having to plan their day around what times they train, you know, what times they they do certain things because they're not allowed to go into the club. They're not allowed to even link up with a few few lads to to train together, you know, that's been taken away from them. So they've got, they've got fitness equipment. They've got all kinds of different stuff. They, they get on an app with their agent at full 90. They get on this app and all the different players log in and they all train, you know, individually, but together as a group on the app. Okay. Stuff like, um, so the, as, as best they can, they, you know, they train and keep themselves in, in half decent Nick until, some of it gets lifted that they get into the football clubs and um, and start playing again and training. So it's a difficult one for everybody, Robbie, because, look, I'm sure you do. I miss football so much. No. You know, that it's the day-to-day, -day, everything, the rumours that come out and all that. And when rumours come out now, it's not the same. No, no. I mean, I was going to I was gonna ask you, obviously, I don't know if you saw today, even Wimbledon, has been cancelled now. That's another big one that's gone. The Olympics has gone. The Euros has gone. Um, is it going to return? I mean, there seems to be a real will from, you know, football to bring it back. I saw, but I even saw today that the Champions League and the Europa League have both been just suspended indefinitely as well. Could we lose this whole season, Kev? Um, Robbie, look... I think there's so many permutations that happen uh, by not doing it. It, it creates an absolute major problem for the league. Clubs will sue because there's certain clubs in a great position who, you know, could qualify for Europe, could get promoted, could stay in the Premier League, etc. And if you avoid the whole season, what do Leeds and West Broms and all them, them boys of this world what do they do? You know, they've been out the they've been out the Premier League such a long time. Leeds are sitting top of the Championship. You know, they want their opportunity to come up. Mm. Now, if the league gets voided, they're going to sue. They're going to have to because 
revenue wise, you know, they're going to suffer. But I, I truly believe that the, the league are going to try and do the right thing and finish the season. And they've got to try and finish it by June the 30th. One is because obviously June the 30th is the cutoff point for contracts. And two, it's the start of the new league year from July 1st. So if you're, if you're a player who's on your last few months of your contract, do you take an opportunity? They're talking about extending contracts. Do you take an opportunity to try and even extend your contract when you probably already, your agent has already organised something for you for two or three years with another club? You wouldn't take the opportunity because if you get injured, no club is going to have you. Mm. So, you know, there's a lot of permutations there that is just going to cause so much problems for, for the league and the administration, etc. So I think oh, people have to get smart about it. They have, to, they have to try and finish this league, even if it's behind closed doors. I don't think any of us would worry about it being behind closed doors, as long as we could see it. Mm. As long as we could watch it, I don't think anybody will be, you know, that down about that. Obviously, we'd love to be able to go. But just to get some football back into our lives would be great. And, uh, you yeah, know, listen, you used to play for Everton, right? So, obviously, not a massive fan of Liverpool's, right? But um, <laughs> if it got voided, that would be harsh on them, wouldn't it? Oh, it'd be very harsh. Look, I, I joke about it with my mate Red Nose John um, and saying, you know, you're not going to win it because, you know, if it's going to get voided. But look, we know they've been the best team. But I think the Liverpool fans and, and, and guys want to win it outright. They, mm. do, they don't want it give, given to them because there's always an asterisk beside it, beside it if something's given to you. And they want to win it outright. They've been the best team. We've got to hold our hands up on that. They've been, they've been sensational this season. And if they get the opportunity to obviously play out the remaining games, then they're going to they're gonna win the league. So I, I don't think anybody knocks them for that. But I just think people would like the little bit of banter that it might cause if, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the, scare, the, you know, the scaremongering of it being voided, I think, more than anything. Yeah, but, you know, you keep saying by the end of June, we're, we're in April now. Yeah. Right. Remember this lockdown that we're under. That we, we've got another two weeks of this left. I'm almost sure they're going to extend this at the end of that, right? Because they keep talking about just flattening the curve, but there's still mm. a long way to go in this thing. How are we going to play football in June? I mean, yeah, you say behind closed doors, but we were sort of making the point the other day. I think it was on the All Guns Blazing podcast that you still need health staff and that to be at these games and things like that. How, how can you, and then you still, this is still the infrastructure needs to be in place, even behind closed doors with staff. If they're still going to be saying social distancing, you know, we, we can't Robbie, get the same one, can we? Robbie, th this football business is a big billion odd pound business. They've got to prepare. They've got to plan. They're talking about quarantine villages. Um, obviously, staff at games. Who's to say you're not going to have certain stadiums that obviously get the, the treatment, certain stewards that get the checks and everything. So there's a whole operation that has to go into having want some down south and some up north um, of, of whatever to do. But people have to be cleared because nobody's going to take the risk of maybe. No, that can't happen. So if we're going to finish this thing, a load of players have to get tested, like medical staff, stewards, cameramen, etc., for the bigger picture to actually it get mm. put into place so games can happen. And then ah. teams go from ground it's a hotel, lockdown. They're still on lockdown, but they just go from one place to the ground, which they know is safe. Yeah, but at the moment, there ain't even enough tests to go around for the people working in the NHS, let alone you're going to then... You, you imagine, the, imagine the backlash there'd be from the general public if they said, right, we're keeping a load of those tests for footballers. People are going to be like, what? I yeah, want my Robbie, test first. Yeah, but Robbie, so it doesn't make sense because... Look at the horse racing. How does that go behind closed doors? Because the horses can't do it themselves. There has to be a load of staff on. There has to be people looking after the horses, etc. 
But none of the none of the horse races over here are, are behind closed. Those are abroad, isn't it? The ones that they're showing, they're yeah, abroad. But it doesn't matter. So what we're saying is, remember, there's there's certain countries where football is still being played. In Belarus, right? Yeah, but and they're getting criticised now, though. They're getting criticised yeah, by they, a lot of people. Yeah, but they're gonna get criticised. You can't win because if you don't do it, people are upset, and there's gonna be lawsuits, etc. Because you're not playing the games. And then if you do play the games, you're going to get criticised. You can't have it both ways. So it's either we're going to do it to finish the league or we don't. All right. What What do you make of the... Um, and we sort of discussed this on last night's show, and I've got to um, ask you about it, being an ex-player. If it had been you and you were playing and then, you know, um, you got a phone call from Arsenal saying, yeah, Kev, we need you to take a... A big pay cut, man, because uh, times are kind of hard here. So, is it cut or a deferral? Well, I'll, I'll, go, deferral. I'll go with both. The, I'll go with both no, scenarios. No, 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 One, no. You, well, you can't cut the contract. That's that's the problem. When so, you, if, so you contract, wouldn't take up? Would would you would you be willing to take the pay cut? I'm taking no pay cut. Even no if way. you're like on a hundred grand a week or something like I'm that, you no wouldn't pay cut. Why none? Why would I take a pay cut? I defer money, hundred percent. So you defer money when you say, right? Oh, you can pay me in two months' time. Yeah, when is pay, me, pay me in a year's time. It doesn't matter. But the but, clubs, are, the clubs are going to lose a lot of money through this, aren't they? They're, they're not going to be able to get back. Well, hey, listen. It's that the clubs make enough money. If we're honest, the clubs make enough money out of the Premier League, etc. And, you know, to ask players to take a pay cut is one thing. To defer money, yeah, players will be more than happy to defer money. But to take a cut? So what happens when this all changes? What happens? Well, then you start getting paid again, but you so would have had to... So deferral then. So don't say pay cut. No, but the teams are taking a pay cut. There's teams... No. There's, um, I saw yeah. the Barcelona... Um, yeah, uh, but it's the No, no, they're yeah, taking a cut. Cut, they're Robbie, taking. Robbie, trust me, they will not be losing the money. They'll take a pay cut because it's a deferral. So, you, so, he's, so, he's, so he's, they're still going to get their money later on. Because how it's, been, how it's been reported about some of the clubs in Europe, like Barcelona, Bayern Munich, Borussia Dortmund, Juventus, is that they are taking a cut. Because they're saying that they want money to be paid to the staff that work there, all the backroom staff, and they want which, those people to get their money. And they're saying fine. we've already we already earn a lot of money. We'll take a cut so those people can still get their money whilst this thing's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, and that's fine, Robbie. That's fine. But like I'm saying, it's it's a deferral because let me just tell you this: if those players at those clubs. Who were say we took a seventy percent pay cut? It all looks nice, but I can guarantee you, when this is all over and done, are they are they, they going to be taking thirty percent? It's going to be very damaging for football, though, isn't it? You've seen like uh, the Daniel Levy from Tottenham. He's coming out yesterday and saying, you know, this is going to change football. This is going to it's going to burst the bubble of football because it's going to have a knock on effect going into the future, isn't it? Well, it could do. It could do, but do you know what it also could do? It could it could make football start to realise, actually, we are more vulnerable relying on um, these TV companies. And everything could change. They might want to take control of all their, their rights around the world now because mm. they're missing out on fortunes, the clubs. On the on the on the model where they control it, they're missing out. The Premier League are missing out on fortunes. So now the clubs might be pushed to say, "Do you know what, Premier League? Let's 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 look into things where we could do it ourselves, and we could actually earn more by by being more global, because the Premier League's global. We 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 all know that, but selling it on to different territories." If you don't fulfill the games, obviously you're going to miss out on money. But if you control it from the outset, 
whether you play or not, your money's in. Mm. So, you know, players ain't going to be asked to take a pay cut because the money is already in from, from the start. Mm. So it might push clubs and, and, and Premier Leagues and stuff like that, the Premier League, to actually take stock of what's actually going on and think, do you know what? We don't like being in this force majeure position where it's an act of God and we're, we're missing out. So we're going to take control of the whole shooting match from here on in. And do, do you, know, you think it might, it, it might change football again for the better? Mm. Do you think it's right that clubs like Tottenham and Newcastle, for instance, right, are applying for that government scheme where the government will pay 80% of the wages for like their stuff, not their players, but for their other staff up to two and a half grand? Do you think that's yeah, right I, I, that these clubs should be applying for that? I mean, with, with the amount of money that they make. Yeah, but you see, Robbie, it's 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 interesting to 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 know that football clubs football clubs are quite unique in how they run because you've got the playing side and then you've got the the non-playing side. The hmm. non-playing side is the, your working guys, your stewards, your people in the office, or whatever you know. If somebody's gonna say, "Look, we've got this to help you," why not go? On, why not get the help? You know, it's there for a reason. And let's be let's be brutally honest. There, football clubs, what they actually make for the government of this country, the Premier League have been brilliant for 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 the government and the taxes and all that kind of thing mm. for twenty odd years. It's been fantastic. Now. They need a little bit of help. Why not get the help? Every team should be plugging into it because, you know, look, the government of 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 Bast in the glory of the Premier League, the most fantastic league in, on on the planet. So mm. now that they need a little bit of help, why not go and get a little bit of help from from the government who have who have you know Bast in the glory of the Premier League for the last twenty odd years? Yeah, very true, very true. Um, lots of questions coming in. Um, from various people's Kev, um, and lots of people bigging you up as well. Here, you can see Brown here saying super Kev. Um, you know, nice uh, one, Brownie. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Dent says, Give Liverpool um the title and the, uh, and call it off. Um, he's he's messaging there from Facebook. Um, yeah, well, we we all know that look for Liverpool fans, we know they've coveted this title for 30 years. I've won a title since. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was I was the one after they won it in nineteen ninety. I won it in, with Arsenal in ninety one. So they've they've covered this title. Of course they have, but they've got to earn it. You've got to win it. <laughs> uh, young Cow says the season will be voided. Two billion people in lockdown, economy in depression. Um, football is not going to happen. That's what he's saying. But you're saying different, Kev. Oh yeah, I am. I'm saying. Look, there's there's too many permutations that happen by being voided. Look, the non-league um, being voided, that's that's causing lawsuits already, and that's non-league mm. because you void the season. All of a sudden, you know, good teams are up, are well clear, going to get promotion, and they're not getting promotion anymore. They, they're going to have to fight. They're going to have to fight. I don't know why they just didn't try and take their time. Premier League is a monetary monetary wise is huge. I think they excuse me, I think they're gonna to have to finish. I really mm. do. I think they're gonna to have to finish the league. Oh well, that's that's Kev's opinion here. He, he wants it finished. Mark Beldes um says a uh, big up Kev legend. Who would you like Arsenal to sign this summer? Now we're gonna to touch on that as well. First of all, before you you say who you'd like to see Arsenal sign, what about a Bamiang? Yep. Right, because that seems to be the rumor. Every minute we're hearing it, left, right, and centre, that Abamyang might go. You, of course, Kev, you was a striker for Arsenal. You know how important it is to have a a striker that, um, like him that can score so many goals. But what do you think is going to happen? Do you think he's <laughs> playing or do you think he's off? Um, uh, it doesn't look good as far as I'm concerned, Robbie. Um, I've got to be honest. I mm. love Abami. I think he's a world class striker. Um, but I just don't think Arsenal were in a position to keep him. We're not. He's got a after. Well, coming up to June, Ju, July first, June thirtieth, July first. He's only got a year left. 
Mm. I can't see us being able to offer him anything like we think we could, even a couple of years ago. Um, we're not in a great position ourselves. And I think he's one of the assets what we can actually cash in on. Because I think there's going to be other op positions and opportunities um, in the team that need addressing. So who, who do you think is, because ordinarily you'd say to yourself, you especially at, you'd be using this period to get this guy signed up, for instance, yeah? Yeah. It seems to be a stalemate on even getting around the table and getting it done. Who do you think is caught? Do you think it's a Bamiyang saying, well, I want to wait and see what happens at the end of the season, see if there's ambition, blah, blah, blah? Or do you think it's a club thinking to themselves, boy, you know what? This guy's going to cost a lot of money to wages for the next few years, man. Like you said, shall we just, let's just cash in. And who, who do you think's the causing this impasse? I don't think it's any one of the, the, the two trying to cause an impasse. I just think it's timing. The mm. timing is so, so wrong for Arsenal Football Club. Obviously, with a, a, a new manager again um, in Mikel Arteta, Arteta's coming and you know he's he's having to he's having to think on his feet. He's having to learn on the job, which you know he's he's done he's done some good things and there's some things that obviously that going to need addressing. But this is probably the biggest challenge for Mikel Arteta right now in his Arsenal managerial um, tenure. And I don't think he's going to be able to keep Aubameyang. And you know what? I, I don't. I think Aubameyang and Lacazette are going to go. Both of them. I think both of them are going to go. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks for cheer. You're trying to cheer us up now. You know no, what I mean? No, no, we no, locked no, down the coronavirus, so now you're telling us they're both Robbie, going. <laughs> Robbie, I'm a straight talker, and you know, I say it as I see it. I both. think Aubameyang, they could get something for. I think Lacazette. The way Arteta wants to play doesn't really fit the system. So I think there's going to be a lot of change. We've got young players coming through. We've got Martinelli who, you know, he could be coveted by some of the big boys as well. We don't want to see that. We bought him for six, six to eight million. And, you know, he's already in double figures as a youngster, 18-year-old kid. You know, will he get a chance? So Mikel Arteta's got a lot of thinking to do yeah, to me but, if they if they get rid of both of them man it's a lack of ambition if well, you get rid you know, of both probably what you gotta think about is he's got to bring in people yeah but you know when you sell you sell those two yeah. who do you bring in you yeah i mean those are two top strikers you're selling yeah and we we already see the prices of some of these i mean Jovic who we've been keep getting linked with you know Real Madrid paid 55 million for him um, last year. He can't hit a barn door. Well, again, does he fit in what with what they do? I don't. I don't think so. I watch a lot. I do a lot of Spanish football. Watch it, and I just don't think he wasn't Zidane's guy. He was signed before Zidane got back, and you know he was like, "Here you go, Zinedine," and Zinedine don't fancy him. So. Again, Mikel Arteta is going to have to think on his feet and he's going to have to be smart about how he does it. Because I, I think to, to play in the system that Mikel Arteta wants, you need spe specialist players in, in, in different positions. And I don't think Arsenal, that there's an imbalance there. Aubameyang's been playing on the left, cutting inside. He can do that, but he's, we know he's more effective going through mm. the middle. But he's not good with his back to goal. So, you know, to, to play in this Mikel Arteta system, you need specific players for specific positions. And, and I just think for all of the talk about, you know, it's no ambition, et cetera, et cetera. Robbie, I look at Sheffield United, I see Sheffield United are above us in the league. Teams who are lesser than us, who are above us in the league, have they got better players than us? No. No. True. But yet they're above us in the league. So, you know, let's... Let's stop thinking about the name on the back of the shirt. Let's get a team that's actually a team functioning and, and, and being aggressive and playing proper Arsenal football that make fans proud. Then we could start thinking about what's on the back of the shirt. OK, brilliant. Let's, let's get a couple more uh, comments here. This one's from uh, Nick. He says, uh, Robbie, I sent you a super chat last week and you didn't read it. Oh, sorry, mate. He said, um, 
I sent it to you anyway today about the documentary saying no need for racists in football. Thank you very much. Um, the documentary is being repeated again tonight, actually, on ITV. If you didn't get to watch it on Monday, it's coming out at 11.40 tonight. A uh, couple other super chats here. Um, Zane says, uh, if we sell them, Kevin, the legend, can you play for us? <laughs> listen, I'm back in training, man. I'm back in training. I'm, I'm, listen, I've got my regime every day. Look, I think what Mikel Arteta has to do, uh, truthfully, he's got a pick. He's we're going to see him in his in his element now because he has to choose the right players to fit the system. Mm. I think that's really important. You saw it happen. What happened with Pep Guardiola at Manchester City when he went there, and you know Pep, the likes of. Um, Leroy Sane and stuff like that. And people are like, who's this Sane guy? Young young kid. But he fits the system so well. Mm. That's what Mikel Arteta has to do for Arsenal. And you may not know the name on the back, but I think it's performances that matter most. True. Um, another super chat here from Mike Oxlow. He says, um, if you had to consider, and this is for you, Kevin, um, either Sanchez or Fabregas as an Arsenal legend, which one would it be and why? I think they're both uh, legends at Arsenal, to be honest. I think Fabregas obviously came to the club as a youngster and done really well. But I think Sanchez as well, you know, some of his performances were sensational. Him and Ozil mm. fitted together perfectly um, in that yeah, Arsenal. And we told him too, got rid of him. That's what I'm saying. We always yeah, you know, get rid of our best players, Kev. We're a selling, Robbie, we're a selling why, why not? Why not build a system around some of these players? Yeah, but we're a selling club. It's we, we look, we were selling these players and we we're in the Champions League. <laughs> so now where there's you know it's touch and go whether we we're either gonna be in Europe next season, you know, there's gonna have to be a, a there's gonna have to be a turnover of players, there's gonna have to be Mikel Arteta's gonna have to do something mm. to address the issues, he's gonna have to bring the wage bill down because look. No disrespect, but Meza Ozil's going nowhere. Meza Ozil has never really had a platform of a, a strong midfield defensive base to play from. And we know he's getting up in years. He's still got quality, but he's going nowhere. So I think Mikel Arteta is going to have to use him for the remaining season of his contract. But the likes of, as I said, Aubameyang and Lacazette, I just, I just don't see them being there next season because both... Mm -hmm have only one year left at the end of this season. Okay. Um, some conundrums being placed here. Um, Tejas Rain says, question for Kevin. Who is who was the better striker? Right? Think carefully how you answer this. Hey, righty or Thierry Henry? And I know you're good friends with righty. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, uh, the striker, I think Thierry Henry is a better player. Definitely a better player than right, but I think Wright is the better striker. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I do. I think because when you look at the amount, it's the way, it's the goals that Ian Wright scores, all the different goals that he scores. Um, you know, scores Fox in the box goals, he scores long rangers, he scores all a, a plethora of headers. I'm not saying that Thierry Henry, because listen, Thierry Henry, in my opinion, is one of the best players Arsenal's yeah. ever had, if not the best player. But I think because of his background of being a winger, mm. he done a lot of his work outside the box and, you know, we could beat people for fun, etc. So as a player, Thierry Henry is a better player. But as a striker, which is what the question was, I think you can't look past righty. OK, um, Amra here, I think he's backing you with a super chat. He says, we can sell Aubameyang or Laka and buy under the radar players from clubs like RB Salzburg. Um, we don't need to spend big money. That's not what um, Arsenal fans want to hear right now. Like that. No, <laughs> Robbie, look, we're all gooners and we love the club. We would look, we argue, we battle, and we but but we love the club in the end, right? What would you prefer, Robbie? Would you prefer a couple of stuck superstars and a failing team, or would you prefer a winning team? True, a winning With team. No obviously, a winning. obviously, a winning team. A give winning, us a team, winning is team. More... Give us a winning team. And, mm. and we, we're actually being shown up by the likes of Sheffield United and Wolves. 
Arsenal, the Arsenal, are being shown up by them. Mm. Something's got to give. We've got to change our philosophy, our mentality, even as fans, about these superstar strikers. Don't need them. What we need is a team. Don't care who scores the goals, as long as we win. Okay. And Nathaniel James there seems to be a big fan of yours, Kev. Um, another super chat. He says, Kevin is the only ex-player who speaks out and speaks the truth. The rest behave like sheep, he says, right? And he says, big up. Right. I don't know. No, you can't say it because... Uh, no, no. It, it, right, he speaks up. Mercer that, speaks up. <laughs> the, the thing is, Robbie, the, the key to it is this. A lot of the other players and ex-players have a lot more connections inside Arsenal because they do quite a bit for Arsenal. Yeah. I do the odd thing, but I'm my own guy. Mm. And and that's what I relish. That's why I could do my the Kevin Campbell show and we could discuss whatever on AFTV. Mm. I can do um, Sky. I can do radio. I can do this, <clears> that, the other. And I could tell it like it is because I'm not one of, I'm not a system guy that, you mm. know, I go in and yes, sir, free, no, sir, free bags full, sir. If I see something needs to be said, I'll say it. And that's the way yeah. I like to be. That's what we love about you, Kev. Um, Seven for Risha as well with another super chat. He says, do you think this pandemic would have a major effect on players' transfers? Would health risk, um, would health risk um, could become a major deciding factor to a point where players would want to take pay cuts in order to stay, i.e. Aubameyang? So what I think what he's getting at is a a team in Italy comes in for you, even yeah. though we we're praying that things will get better in Italy or Spain or something. With what's happened over there, and that could still happen to us. Maybe Aubameyang says, "No, actually, you know what? I'm happy in London, man. I want to stay here." Or, you know, I don't know. I think that's what he's getting at. Yeah, Robbie, I think it's a difficult one because we don't know when borders are going to open. Mm. We don't know when leagues are going to start or. If this if this season is going to be voided, or you know when when does preseason? Let's say let's say for argument's sake, this season finished in mid July. For mm. argument's sake, when does preseason start for next season? Mm. It, nobody knows. So and and by that time, our borders open. If the Italian borders open, which we certainly hope it is, and you know pray for everybody out there. If the Italian borders open, but the Spanish border isn't then the Italian clubs have an advantage mm. because then they could cover the better players who could probably uh, move and transfer. So it's a, it's a weird one. There is no right or wrong answer, but the key is the borders have to be open before any transfer activity really going to happen because while we're on lockdown, nobody's going anywhere. Now this, this gentleman here is a school ZMD. I don't know. I can't confirm this, first of all, right? So, but what he's saying is, to give you an idea of how pathetic Stan Kroenke is, Los Angeles is on lockdown, yet the stadium construction with 3,000 workers has not been put on hold. Of course, that's the stadium that he's building for the LA Rams. Arsenal will never win with Kroenke at the helm. I mean, once again, we can't confirm that, but that's what he's saying. Well, we do know that, look, certain certain countries have different ideas on, on on a lockdown construction some of these these guys you know this it'll probably cost them too much to mm. to stop to stop work so they're just getting on with the construction or getting it to a point or whatever i, I don't particularly know I, i'm not an expert on this type of stuff mm. but one thing i can say about this dan Kroenke, um situation is arsenal have gone backwards under his stewardship um his ownership and I think the first right move um, was getting Gazidis out. Mm. And the next right move was getting Arteta in. Now, obviously, with, with the lockdown, etc., it's, it's put things on a kind of a hold. But I think Mikel Arteta knows what he wants to do. I think he knows the type of players that he needs. He, he needs a functioning team. He needs a hard-working team. Mm. And I don't think he needs superstars. I think he needs to be able to go out there and do things his way. And signing big players um, with big names could be a, a, a poison chalice for 
Mikel Arteta. I really do. And I think we need a we need a winning team. We need a team that are going to fight and function and reflect what the fans um, have. So if that happens, understand Kroenke and the team start to win, I don't think anybody will start to complain. But his ownership right now has left a lot to be desired. Mm. Not every player, as you said, starts off as a superstar player. And one player who was a superstar player who then sadly passed away was David Rocastle. You played with him um, at Arsenal. What was he like as a guy? Because there was lots of tributes being um, made to him yesterday. Obviously, the 31st of March was the date he passed away. Yeah. Um, what, what, first of all, when you got that news, how was it for you? How did you feel? And then what sort of person was he, Kev? Because, as I said, um, you played with him. Yeah. Well... When, I, when the news came through that Rocky had passed, I was, and I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to do. I was kind of numb mm. because Rocky was a constant in my life coming through the ranks. And he was, he was such a humble, caring guy who, who loved Arsenal like you wouldn't believe who just wanted the best for the club and the, the players. You know, he... I look at this, there's two Rockies. There was Rocky on the pitch, fierce competitor, unbelievably skillful, the South London Brazilian, as we called him. <laughs> and, you know, he was a he was dynamite. He could play centre mid, he could play right mid. He had that flair, but he had that toughness that all the fans loved. Rocky would get stuck in. And I, I don't know if you remember... Um, Robbie, at Anfield at 1-0, there's a picture mm. of Rocky in the middle of the pitch and he's like, come on, we could do... You know, Tony Adams yep. was a leader, but Rocky was the, the, the silent glue that knitted everyone together. Rocky mm. was good with everybody in the football club. Rocky done a lot of stuff outside of the realm of on the pitch. He done a lot off the pitch for Arsenal. There's a saying that's been at Arsenal that shows Arsenal's class for years about who you are, what you want, who you represent. That mantra is kind of Rocky's because mm. he always carried himself with that class. He always had always had a nice time, always had time for fans. I think yep. I've mentioned, you know, waking that fan up after 89, waking that fan up when we got back to the ground and Rocky said, you know, let's wake him up. So we woke him up and we sat there, had a beer with him on the step. And Rocky asked him, you know, tell us about your, your what was your night like? And the fan was like, oh, my God, Rocky, I can't believe it. So, you know, th stuff like that mm. for a fan who, you know, is just probably at high, was at Highbury just because he was too drunk, he couldn't even make it home. <laughs> Gets woken up on the step and, you know, Dave Rojas was there showing him his medal, takes him into the marble halls and having a beer with him and, you know, just asking him about, you know, mm. what his evening was like. That sums Rocky up. Rocky was Mr. Arsenal. Him mm. and Tony Adams together. Rodders was the leader, but Rocky was the silent leader. Mm. He was like glue. He was such a fantastic guy, Robbie. A lot of people... And anybody were... who met him, yeah. anybody who met him was drawn to him because he was just so genuine. A lot of people were suggesting yesterday, what about a statue for him? Or what about a stand being named? He's such an iconic figure at Arsenal. What, it's quite surprising that they've not considered that. Like, even a stand. I, I think, you know, maybe a stand named after him at the ground. Look, it, it, could, it could be a statue. I think a statue kind of is perfect, to be honest, because, mm. you know, there's iconic statues around the ground of, of some of the most iconic players at Arsenal. And Rocky is an iconic Arsenal player. We still now, sing his name. We still sing his name now. Yeah, still sing his name all the time, which is fantastic. But having a statue, I think that makes Rocky live on because people could take the picture with the statue and, you mm. know, hang the scarf around Rocky's neck and, you know, do stuff like that. I think that is fitting with what the Emirates is mm. for Rocky to have a statue for sure. That'd be brilliant. Um... Super chat here from I'm Aguna Terry he says, thank you so much for coming on Claude and the Banster's last night. Um, Kevin, really appreciate it. Um, only touch on it yesterday. 
like to know more and why you and the rest of the players didn't like Bruce Rioch. Okay, sorry, I did. I, I kind of got a bit uh, confused with the end of that. No, yeah, I'll answer that. Yeah, I mean, so what? Why? No, what's, is the it? Bad, what's the bad? Why didn't you? Like Bruce You're right. You know, you, huh? I didn't know Bruce Rioch, but I met him once, and that was it. I had a decision hmm. to make, Robbie. There was a lot of uh, there was a lot of upheaval happening. George Graham had, had, had got sacked. Stuart Hooson had taken over as caretaker manager, but wasn't getting the managerial job. Uh, my contract was up at Arsenal, so mm. I, you know, so I had a quick decision to make. There was a contract on the table from Arsenal, but obviously I needed to see who the new manager was going to be. I met the new manager once. I've said it before. Once was enough for me. <laughs> um, we didn't see eye to we didn't see eye to why. Why? Solely because, why? Solely because he he wasn't asking he wasn't asking me. You know. We, we want you to sign in, etc. He was telling me I'm signing. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was telling me, right, you're going to be here and you're going to sign. No, no. He, 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 hasn't earned, he hasn't earned that right to be able to come in and talk to me like that. So I just thought, no problem. I shook his hand. I said, no problem. And I remember I got out of the meeting and I rang righty. I says, all the best righty with this guy. And uh, <laughs> he said, "What, Camja? You, you, what are you doing? You signed?" I said, "No, no." I said, "Look, I love Arsenal." I said, "But this guy's going to rob me up the wrong way, and I'm, uh, I'm not having it." So, <laughs> so I've got an opportunity. I've got an opportunity to, to, to move on. So that's what I'm going to do. I said because I don't know. I said I don't know what's going to happen with this dressing room, and as you know, Robbie. You know, there was <laughs> so, yeah. loads of him fighting with this guy. Well, so was Wrighty, was Wrighty ringing you up a couple of months later and saying, yo, you're right, you know, this guy. <laughs> a couple of months, a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> look, man, it was, look, and this is no disrespect to Bruce Rea, but, yeah. you know, he, he he caused a lot of a lot of angst in, in the dressing room. And when the likes of Ian Wright is looking to put a transfer request in, and the rumor has it that Tony Adams was even looking at, you know, if this guy stays, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm off. Mm. Um, so that was know. player power, even in those days. That player power was there, wasn't it? We well, we hear a lot about power. we hear a lot about that now. Player power. Yeah. You'll see, player power. Player power got rid of Bruce Rowe, didn't it? Well, no, it wasn't just player power. It was you got to remember there was a great man on the board in David Dean. Mm. And David Dean liked order, but he liked Arsenal people. And when you've got your big players in the dressing room being unhappy, something's got to give. Do we? I, I'm, I'm, how much do we miss not having this guy David Dean involved in the club? Every time, every time I see him, I'm always saying. David, man, when you're gonna come back? And he's very, you, you know him already. He's a diplomat. He never ever say anything bad about the current guys and stuff like that. But we're still missing a trick by not having him in some way involved in Arsenal. Well, uh, uh, Robbie, if we're honest, after what he done and what he achieved at the football club, having a lesser role wouldn't do him justice. Just wouldn't do him justice. And I'm not sure whether the new regime could actually get him in. Because I'm sure there'd be certain conditions if David Dean was looking to come back to Arsenal, there'd be certain conditions he'll want that they they wouldn't be able to uh to to meet. So, mm. you know, he's probably in his best position outside of the football club right now because I swear to you, if that man ever came back. You know, he there would there would be changes at Arsenal. Uh, significant That's probably why changes. they don't want him back, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. They you know ousted him for a reason. They got him out for a reason, and you know that and man, success went like that after exactly. he left. Robbie, look, he he had Arsenal in his blood. He had Arsenal at the best of his heart. He always did. You know, I mean, when I was a kid coming through. David Dean was at the was at the youth team games in the morning, and then after about an hour, 
65 minutes, you know, he would he would leave and then you go back to the ground and then obviously David Dean's there in the uh, in the director's box, etc. So he knew what he wanted. He was he had Arsenal in his heart. He wants he only wanted the best for Arsenal. He wanted Arsenal to be winning and challenging. And you know, unfortunately, I don't think we have people on the board now or, or in and around it who think the way he does. There's a question there from uh, Jeffrey. Um, he says, Kev, if offered, will you join the Arsenal coaching team? Um, why have you depends. never? You've never. Why have you never got into to coaching and and considered management and stuff? We, you know, we we always hear the question of not having enough black managers in the game. The way well, you we, talk, well, I, the way what I know from you, you would make a brilliant coach. Robbie, I was I was involved in um, doing my badges, etc. When I was at Everton, and it was myself, Big Dunk, Alan Stubbs, Davy Weir, and then I then I moved to West Bromwich Albion, and I had I, I had enough on my plate, <laughs> West Bromwich Albion, uh, with the Great Escape, and then eight sixteen months into the contract, we were talking about having a player stroke coaching role mm. with Brian Robson. Look, Brian Robson, Nigel Pearson, Craig Shakespeare. They've all gone on to manage. Robinson. They've all gone to manage. All, so, all three of them have exactly, gone to manage. Exactly. But what happened at the end of that season, um, the, the chairman pulled my contract. So I couldn't even do... So I couldn't get onto that side of things. Mm. But sometimes it's... You know these things happen for a reason, and it, maybe it's not, it's not meant to be, Robbie. But you know, oh, I would have loved to. I would have loved to. I think you would have made a good manager. I really do, man. I could see. You know, I could see you on the sidelines with a suit on. You know, what I mean, directing things, and I could see you, man. You, know, you, you, to me, you got that, and I, I know you personally, right? Yeah. And I know how you talk, and I know how you're opinionated, and I know how you're a, a person. You're really driven. You work really, really hard. That's what a lot of people don't know about this guy. I can tell you to this day, this guy. He, I'll get up and my. I'll get up sometimes. He sent me a message like five in the morning, so I know he wakes up really early, and he's at his work early. You would have made a brilliant manager, man. Robbie, look, all is not lost, but you know, there's a lot of water gone under the bridge. Um, in the managerial stock coaching sense. But look, just just having two boys who are looking to make a name for themselves in football <clears throat> and, and and trying to be a, a dad to them, that's that's hard enough. Yeah, that's true. To, to, to juggle it in with everything else. And do you know what, Robbie? The next best thing is is talking about football and helping people understand what football's about. Yeah. And that's what that's really what I love. I love that side of things. I love the opportunity that you gave me regarding the, the, the show. I'd love to be able to do more stuff re regarding debating people because Definitely. I think no, a really. lot of people have big opinions. But when you actually get into a debate about it, mm. people start to see. I think that's why myself and Lee Judges kind of work because mm. Lee looks at it from a fan's point of view. I'm a fan, but I'm an ex player. So when you put that combination together, everybody gets the best of everything. So I yeah, think I missed that's the show. Man. I'd love to do more of that. Yeah, I missed the show with you and Lee, man. That's a brilliant show. Um, it, it, uh, hi there, says uh, Kevin Campbell, the next Pep, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, is that Pep Ryan... to Bismol? <laughs> Not Pep to Bismol, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Ryan here says, um, why are we talking about black manager? Um. Why are we talking about black managers? It sounds racist. If you're good enough, you will make it. Well, the reason why I say black managers is because not, nothing, it's just that there's not enough. When I look at how many black footballers there are in not just the Premier League, across all leagues, then I look, why are there more, not more black managers? The only one in the Premier League is um, Nuno, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. you know, no, and no black, you know, we're the black British managers as well. And so many of you guys have played the game. And I, it just seems weird to me that when I look down all the divisions, I'm like, 
where are you guys? Robbie, what's fascinating is you you could mention you can mention managers, but you know when you look at all the managers and there's only one black manager, that's why we mentioned <coughs> yeah. black manager because there's such a severe lack of black people who are in managerial positions in within football. You know, decision making doesn't happen. Um, you know, on on the boards, it's great. Les Ferdinand's on the board at QPR. Yeah, um, he's in a position, but you know, it's few and far between, isn't it? That that's why we mention it because there's a severe lack of it. Mm. Yeah, there, there really there really is a lack of it. And um, as I said, I think we you know the trick has been missed by not getting you in because I think if there's ever a guy that like I look at and say this guy can change things, it's you. You know what I mean, you're you're that type of person. You, you know what I mean, you're you you're not scared to say say it as it is, and that's what that's what I love about you. Um, Robbie, Robbie, I have strong <clears> views. <throat> I have strong <throat> views about football. I have strong views about you know when uh, uh, just quickly a lot of people talk about these youngsters. They're given too much too soon. They're not. Mm. They're not given too much too soon. We, we were given too much too soon when I was young, I suppose. But the the thing is, it's it's the narrative and it's the it's the culture within the football club that actually molds the players. All right, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna let me do this. Let me do this um, comment here, and I'm gonna come back to that. Actually, uh, Mike says uh, Kevin Campbell was immense at Nottingham Forest, as well as big Pierre Van Hooydon. I remember him. He yeah. went on strike, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> what was it like playing with him? Um, I would love to know. Um, I thought he was um, a brilliant player. He was a he was a good player, weren't he, Van Oydon? Yeah, but he kind of ruined it with that strike thing, hasn't it? Well, look, Pierre was a fantastic player, Dutch international. Yeah, and our games just seemed to to dovetail perfectly when when he came in, and it was Dave Bassett who put us together, and we went on a we ended up winning the championship. Well, I think our partnership was the high scoring partnership in Europe. We're just about to have an assault on the, the Premier League. PS3 kicks were incredible. Anywhere yeah. from four yards out, watch out. He could score from. He practiced them every single day. Mm. He was a great guy, funny guy as well, but he was very serious about his football. And when you look at that team, you know, we had a, a lot of quality in that team, a lot of Premier League quality in that team. And, um, you know, it was we were that cutting edge of that team, me and Pierre. Mm. There was times where I could uh, I could come in behind as a number ten. There's times where I could play on the shoulder and he could be that number ten. So you know, it really dovetailed nicely. And again, ended up getting promotion. But Robbie, you you mentioned that that him going on strike. Right. It was because of me. <laughs> Why you went on strike? Why? Because the club. Irving Scholar, if we know who Irving Scholar is, I remember him <laughs> at the time was yeah. the, the chairman at Nottingham Forest. And I don't know why, but he accepted a bid from Trabzon Sport for me. Mm. So I was at the airport. Well, I got told I'm not going on the club tour, and they think it's in my best interest to accept the to accept it that I'm going to be sold. So I said, okay, no problem. I, I'll go and find out and see what's what. So I was at the airport and my phone rang. It was Pierre. He said, is it true? I said, is what true? He said that the club are selling you. I said, well, I'm just about to get on a flight to Istanbul. I'll call you when I get there, Pierre. He says, no, tell me now. I said, yeah, well, I'm on my way to Istanbul now. He said, well, I'm not going back. I thought it was nothing of it. I thought he'd go back because he was on a break from international duty. And I went over and I was speaking to Pierre and he said, I'm not going back. So as I signed in Turkey and as my career started going off in Turkey, there was just no Pierre. Just never went back. He never went back until I think it was December time to Nottingham Forest, and you know, kept in touch with him. But he just said, "I can't. I feel so betrayed by the football club." But again, that's a football club. Who? Why would you sell your best? Your, your two strikers? You give you a chance to 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 push on in the league. But they, you know, they they broke it up. So it's because of you, why? Because what? Because the the perception was always that he went on strike for money. No, it was it was because the club sold me. Oh wow! All right, well you cleared that one. All these years, it's not going to do nothing for him now. No. <laughs> but all these years later, because um, 
he, he got a lot of stick for it at the time, didn't he? A hell of a lot of stick. A hell of a lot of stick for and, going And, you know, Robbie, do you remember, I think um, Ron Atkinson was manager. Mm. At, he came in and was manager at the time. And Carton Palmer and uh, Carton, CP, I love CP. But they didn't know Pierre. Obviously, they're coming in from a point of, you know, all hands to the pump, we need help, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a prima donna over there not not putting his lot in. Mm. But they didn't know Pierre. Do you know what I mean? They didn't know him. And he, he felt, he really did feel let down by the club. And listen, I'm not saying it was right what he'd done. But, you know, it, it, it hurt him that much that he couldn't face a lot of the people at the club at the time. Mm. So, what, just going, going back to what you said before about young players, yeah, not getting too much too soon. Don't you yeah. think sometimes that some of those young players do get too much too soon? You know, what I mean, they're like, you know, before they've even you've got players now before they've even played for the first team, they're rolling past you in a Range Rover. They've got the latest Louis bag. Gucci shoes and I'm listen. Look, I, I'm a, I'm, yeah, a, I'm Robbie, all for a listen. I'm all for a man. I'm all for a man, right? Yeah, but Robbie, enjoying his money, right? You've earned that money. I know how hard it is to come through the system and to become a professional footballer. But sometimes, don't you think that if you've got all that stuff before you've actually even kicked a ball for the first team, that that can kind of get in your way? You you kind of start to think to yourself, I made it already without actually making it on the pitch first. And I'm, a, as I said, I'm a person that I like to see players rewarded. I like to see them enjoy themselves because they've worked hard. I see the how, this, um, how football is. And it's only a tiny percentage of players that make it. So not every single one of those players, for instance, in the Premier League, they have worked so hard to get to where they are. I appreciate all that. But sometimes, don't you think, some of... It's a bit too much for certain players. <laughs> Robbie, you're gonna get that. You're gonna get that in 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 any business that's so high profile. You are gonna get that. But what I look at is the culture. I look at the culture at some of these clubs. I look at look at the amount of players who came through the Arsenal ranks under George Graham, the likes of Adams and Rocast and Thomas and. You know, Martin Hayes and all these guys. There was, there was, they were ahead of the curve. They, they had all the trappings, but there was, there was no problem. But not but like they, now. Now's but crazy. No, no, isn't no, it? But, 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 what I'm going to say to you now is, there's a young lads who are coming through at Arsenal right now, who are showing some, some signs of life, who are showing that they're very good players. So why are they different to the ones just before them? How are they different? They're not. The difference is the narrative from within the club and the culture from within the club. You've got the likes of Steve Bold being inside. You've got the likes of um, Freddie Lundberg being inside the club. Players who have been there, seen it, done it, who could, who could help these youngsters mentally. Because earning whatever you earn is one thing. The moment you come into the club, that doesn't matter. What matters is you doing your work and you having the discipline and the quality and the class to be an Arsenal player. And that ain't just on the pitch, that's off the pitch as well. A lot of the old ways have gone. We, we need to get that back. And I honestly think we are starting to slowly get it back um, with the Steve Bold stepping down from first team. And nobody mentions this. He steps down to under-23s and now a lot of the under-23s are pushing for the first team. Why? It happened with him when he was youth team manager. The likes of Jack Wiltshire and all those boys were coming through. Never got enough credit. And I still think now Steve Bold goes down. He's doing a great job. Nobody even mentions him. Mm. True, true. Listen, Kev, I could talk to you all day. It's been absolutely brilliant having you on today. We've even... The show's run quite longer. I said to you at the start, um, before we came on, I said, normally we go about 25 minutes, half an hour. We've gone an hour, you know? Really? And... I, do you know what I don't even look? <laughs> it's been... No, it, it's been, it's been get um... me on again, will you? Get me on again. I'll, I'll get, next week, you're around next week, I'll get you I'm back around, on, mate. Listen, you know I'm mean? around. 
Get me on. Well, you ain't going nowhere, right? <laughs> Get me on, my man. Uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure um, having you on today. And I, I really want to thank you and just keep up all the good work. And, you know, good luck to your son as well, who's um, there at Stoke working really, really hard. And I hope that for his sake and for all of our sakes, we get football back on as soon as possible. Um, obviously, the coronavirus, is, it all depends on that. Um, but it was fantastic to have you on tonight, Kev. And um, we'll have you on again very soon. Robbie, thanks for having me on. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And for all the questions, brilliant. Up the Arsenal. Come on. Up the Arsenal. Thank you very much, Kev. And um, don't forget, um, if you want to check out the documentary um, that I did for ITV, that's being repeated again tonight on at 11.40, a little bit later um, than it was on the other night. But you ain't got to go work tomorrow, have you? <laughs> so why not? Um, thanks very much. And we will be back tomorrow.